Hello, I'm Sada Ashra. I'm CEO of Super Union North America. And I am here today to talk about who, who tells your purpose-led story. I'm joined by Lisa Sherman, the CEO and president of the Ad Council. We at Super Union were proud partner a few years ago to launch the new brand of the Ad Council. We've been a proud partner to them. I've joined the board of directors and met the most amazing group of people led by Lisa Sherman. I have to say, every single time I see that rail, I get a little bit emotional. We still feel it all these years later. Lisa Sherman, who is the president and the CEO of the Ad Council, the Ad Council, which works at the intersection of media, marketing, technology, entertainment, and advertising, convening the world's best marketers to create public engagement campaigns. The Ad Council tackles the most pressing issues facing the country. It's such an amazing organization. I'm so happy to be here with you, Lisa. I wish we were in person, but this is second best. Well, uh, I'm thrilled to be doing this with you and thrilled to have you on our board. And the work that you did for us was amazing, as you just saw in that reel. Well, thank you. And this topic that we're about to hit on together is near and dear to both of our hearts. And so as we just jump right in, I would love to talk to you about the just number one, the amount of awe and inspiration and what we saw the Ad Council do right as soon as the pandemic hit, as everybody was trying to respond, interpret, understand, and everybody wanted to contribute. And they were trying to figure out how, and you and your team really understood how to galvanize and pull together organizations to make things happen at lightning speed and would just would love to hear about that process and how you were able to do that. I would love to talk about it. So when, when, our, when, when your mission is to tackle the most important and pressing issues facing the country, your business model is fundamentally wired for crisis. And th there was not a bigger crisis uh, than the one that we're in right now. Um, and so that business model helps us to move fast and to scale quickly um, but we saw nothing like the magnitude that we saw uh, in the early days of COVID. About five days after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, um, we were able to be out in the marketplace with lots of uh, creative assets, really focused on, if you remember at the time, you know, fact-based um, health vetted uh, information about how we could keep our family safe, how we could keep ourselves uh, safe. Um, and I think because we were able to get out there so quickly, uh, people, the phones rang, you know, the emails were just flying in. People just wanted to know how they can help. Um, and uh, we've always had an amazing group of partners. It is the place where our industry comes together. Uh, competitors sort of put their gloves down and, and link arms to collaborate on tackling big issues. And we just saw that um, really um, multiplied times 10. Um, and what I think we really focused on uh, early on was the importance of prioritization. Like, what do we do first and how do we go next? Um, and, um, you know, there were times where people were just saying, just give me a job. And so, you know, we had some early assets in the market, as I've mentioned, and we realized we didn't have radio. So we called one of our partners and said, could you develop radio scripts? And we realized we didn't have any out of home assets. And we literally sent a note and said, could you help? And literally everyone said, yes, they were thrilled to have a job and they delivered it uh, quickly and, and brilliantly. And I will just say in the last six or seven months, as a collective, our industry um, helped us to secure almost $400 million in donated media to get these important messages out there, 33 billion impressions. Uh, most importantly, um, you know, we have seen uh, this, we haven't seen this level of support ever, uh, even after other moments of crisis like 9-11, like Superstorm Sandy, uh, like Hurricane Katrina. Um, so we are uh, really thrilled um, with the, the efforts of our industry. Yeah, and truly impressive. I mean, I remember just immediately feeling like things had just happened and already on my television set at home as I was trying to navigate what was going on. There you were with these organizations and everywhere 
at that time I was in New York City and everywhere you turn, whether it was locally or even on the radio or on the television, just these partners were showing up as one. And it did really, it, it felt fast. And since then, it wasn't just about the beginning. You really felt, you know, an ongoing, passionate group of people convict, like, with such conviction showing us the way. Absolutely. With that, there are obviously within the Ad Council, there are 30 plus absolutely amazing campaigns that are always being worked on. And we saw a number of them just now, even in the real. And hopefully many of them were familiar to so many of us. They've been around for a long time and they just, they hit you in places that you really feel and you understand the importance. Could you talk to us a little bit about what some of those campaigns specifically, like which ones of them immediately, I'm sure it was all, but which stories would you want to share about some of those immediate campaigns and how they were um, how they were reacting to and how it felt um, to be leading those campaigns and what their results were in terms of impact and communication with the outside market based off of things such as the pandemic, the social and racial injustices that were long overdue brought to people's awareness as the summer started and just that that journey in these last six months. Sure. Well, I mean, as I said at the beginning, you know, it felt very important to prioritize. And we, we really had all hands on deck focusing on the first round of COVID work, which was, you know, as you recall, really about how do we keep ourselves safe, our family safe. We learned a term we never heard of called social distancing um, for the first time. And now it's part of the lexicon. Um, we, we were focused on face coverings and hygiene. Um, but I think we quickly saw uh, and understood the broader ramifications of, of this virus um, and the impact it had on so many other issues and frankly, other issues that we were already working on. So, um, you know, we've been uh, working on the issue of hunger uh, for a very long time. And uh, I, I'm sure you remember as I do those horrible images of lines of cars waiting to get into food banks. And um, we quickly pivoted on our existing hunger campaign to support the folks at Feeding America and food banks all across the country uh, to be much more specific to what was going on in that moment. Um, you know, as we found ourselves in quarantine, uh, hold up um, with limited access to people and things, you know, the issues of mental health that we've been dealing with for a very long time really became amplified. You know, folks were feeling depressed and anxious and isolated. And we, again, quickly looked at those issues and worked uh, to um, really pivot that campaign uh, to deal with things in the moment. Um, caregiving and caregivers and the role that caregivers play, always an issue we've been working on for a number of years. It took on new meaning. In the, in the days of COVID, and it still does. And then, frankly, I will say that, um, you know, there are some issues I didn't expect to have to focus on, uh, but sadly, I think we saw in the early days and throughout this pandemic, um, uh, the xenophobia that started to really rear its ugly head. Um, I think one stat I remember, 2,000 reported incidents of, of discrimination and hate against the API community, the Asian Pacific Islander community. Uh, and we just felt like we had to do something. We just couldn't sit on the sidelines. And so we have a longstanding campaign called Love Has No Labels, which focuses on diversity and inclusion. And we did a hard pivot on that and went very specifically uh, down the path of um, raising awareness about this discrimination um, and got that work out very, very quickly. We did the same after the George Floyd murder and partnering with Black Lives Matter. Um, and so those were things that I would not have expected to be part of, of sort of pandemic related work, but sadly, um, you know, those underlying um, prejudices and discrimination really came to the surface and we just couldn't stand by and, and watch it happen. Mm. I can definitely see that. and. Even as a personal anecdote, talking about both speed to getting the messages out, as well as the things that each of us might have been experiencing um, from a standpoint of the Asian American, the, the biases. When I was starting to even feel it myself on the streets in New York, I turned on the television and I saw, okay, 
you're already one step ahead. You're aware at least you're helping. And um, it, it's, it's an amazing guiding force along those lines. And so would love to learn a little bit more knowing the kinds of people that we also have together today um, in this actual conference and thinking about leaders, thinking about leaders of um, different kinds of organizations and nonprofits as well, but just technology, all different industries. When people start thinking specifically about their own organizations and what this change has both meant for them and what they've experienced, can you share a little bit about what it was like for you and leading your organization? And we all know you to be a very open, honest, transparent leader. And and some of the challenges that you might have felt in these last six months as a leader internally that you were managing at the same time as you were managing everything else um, that you were doing. How much time do we have? <laughs> I think it's only a 20 minute session. We can start the conversation now and find this later for sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I will say that uh, I don't know where this came from, but I, you know, early days really felt like I needed for myself uh, when there was so much coming at me, a set of guiding principles uh, from which I could filter and make decisions. And uh, I try and break things down pretty simply. And for me, it was three things. One, number one, always was the health and safety of our employees. Number two uh, was that I felt strongly that we had to continue to be able to fulfill our mission as an organization. When you're an organization wired for crisis, we've got to be able to show up and show up really well. Um, and then finally, I felt like we had to do everything we could to ensure the long-term viability of this organization that's been around for 75 plus years. And I will tell you that, you know, we were dealing with our own internal challenges, especially in the early days. One of our big fundraisers was a big annual dinner that is typically held in early December. And it was quite obvious uh, back in, I think, April that that dinner was not going to happen. And so we had to make a very quick decision to cancel it. Now, that was worth millions of dollars in revenue to the organization. Um, and so we had to quickly think about um, what we were going to do if your guiding principle is uh, to continue to fulfill your mission and to ensure the long-term viability of the organization. What are you going to do to, to make up that money and, and generate new revenue? And our team create, came up with a really great idea to create a crisis response and recovery effort. Um, and we went out to our, our friends and our partners and our board members and under, they understood they'd seen the work we'd already done uh, and were continuing to do. They understood how the trajectory of the, the pandemic was gonna take us well into uh, 2021. And I can't uh, tell you just how generous they were, how quickly they responded with uh, incremental funding um, and we were uh, able to generate the revenue uh, that we needed that we would have lost um, uh, by, by canceling that dinner. And so I think that's just an example of uh, uh, some of the things we were dealing with internally while we were furiously uh, working to put out important messages for the public to see. And, you know, as I often try and take a step back and say, you know, what did we learn from this? I mean, to me, it demonstrates the power of trusted relationships that are built over time, um, the power of and the value of collaboration, um, which uh, really we couldn't do any of the things we did without it. Um, and then I think, you know, it was hard to be able to go to our employees with that news. You know, we just canceled the dinner. Um, we're going to be down millions of dollars. That means that we all had to make some personal sacrifices. Um, you know, in terms of our own bonuses and things like that. Um, uh, but we had to be able to fulfill our mission and that was an obligation. So I feel like being radically transparent uh, and honest as soon as we possibly could with everybody, I think helps to build the trust um, and get people um, sort of on board uh, with what we had to do. And um, uh, I'm very proud of our teams. I'm extraordinarily proud of our, our partners. It's just been an amazing amazing year that way. Yeah, I can definitely see that the group of people that you lead are people who 
and we come across, I come across in so many different aspects of my own career. And I always feel that there's a commonality of the types of people who work there and a conviction to do the right thing and an ability to just galvanize. Next thing you know, everyone's answer is yes, what more can we do together? And so it, it certainly has been impactful and so needed this year. So let's talk a little bit about next year quickly, because I sure. think we all know that this year has been, it's been a challenging year and it's been a really important year for growth and development and reflection and consideration of how we can be moving forward. And so when you think about next year and we think and we talk to a number of the other leaders of organizations in this conference right now, what are some words of wisdom or some things that you would want to impart for those who either have purpose-led brands already or on the evolution or heading in that direction because we all know the importance of it and to stand up for something and to be very clear and open and honest about that. What are different ways that they can be thinking about moving and leading their organizations moving forward? Well, I know you've dealt with this and I think many of the folks that I talk to, I, I, you know, adjusting to the new reality of this pandemic actually revealed some better ways of doing things. Um, and uh, you know, I think that uh, we are looking hard and I would encourage others to look hard at our pre-COVID business and, our, our, and ask ourselves, you know, what's working better now than it was before? And, and how do we begin to reimagine how we do things on the other side of this um, and not go back to normal, you know? Like, right. I, I don't know that we can ever go back to normal. I, I think it's really about thinking about how you create a new normal and, and that's not just with respect to our businesses. I think that goes to how we live our lives on a personal basis, you know, where we're stuck at home. And, you know, for me, I have to say, I've had to really draw much better boundaries between what it means to be at work and at home. Um, and, and that's something that I think I will take into uh, the new year when we actually get to go to our offices again, whenever that will be. I think related to that, um, you should, I don't think we should ever wait, waste, waste a crisis, you know. Um, I think some of the, tr the transitions and changes we're making were things we were already talking about doing, but it just accelerated because it had to. And I just think we should think about that as business people as well. Um, and then I think I learned a lot personally, and I think we all did, I, I hope, um, about looking at everything through a lens of equity in ways that we just haven't before. Uh, and to be better listeners and to be humble and to learn things that perhaps we didn't know before um, and, and to approach that with a high level of, of humility. So those would be my quick lessons and the way I'm thinking about it and perhaps they're helpful to others. Well, definitely. And I certainly find them helpful. And it's one of those types of things that Lisa, every single time we have a chance to be able to connect and learn about all the different things that are on your mind that you're seeing from other incredible leaders. It's so wonderful you share them. So thank you for Thanks, that. Saba. Learned a lot, inspired, ready to do more. Take good care and thank you so much. Thank you. Today.